Check your Bibles, if you would. Turn to the book of Exodus, chapter number 34. Exodus 34. Well, last Friday we gathered in this auditorium to remember and celebrate the life of a very good man. Brother Harold Glover, longtime member of Calvary Baptist Church, 40 years as a member. He was a deacon. He ran a bus route for a long time. He was the second grade boys Sunday school teacher. And last week he got to go home and see the face of Jesus. And we're very, very thankful for him on our side of heaven. Our hearts are sad, but I believe, is, is, is Ida here today, his, his wife of 47 years, Ida Glover's right back here. Would you give her a big hand? Ida, we love you. And Wendy, just, just know y'all are going to be in our prayers during this season and just anything at all we can do for you. But I told Ida on Friday, um, I think more so than in any time recently, this particular funeral, and this maybe because of Father's Day, maybe because of this weekend, but I, I had more thoughts of my dad this weekend than I have in a long, long time. It was eight years ago, December, that my best friend in the world went home to be with Jesus. A year prior, he had found out that he had prostate cancer, and it was already pretty far advanced. It uh, was the very aggressive type and spread to his brain, spread all over his body, and he didn't have to suffer long at all. But right there around Christmas time, uh, such a jolt to our family and to my system to have my dad leave this life and, and go to the next one. I, I say without qualification, my dad was my best friend in the world. We had kind of that emotional shorthand. We didn't even have to say a lot of words. We could just kind of be in the same room and know what the other one was kind of thinking. If there was something funny in the room or something we wanted to make fun of, we usually would just need a glance at each other, and that was pretty often. Uh, I'll never forget the, the deep conversations about Christ and the faith. I'll never forget after becoming a husband and after becoming a daddy, how many times I'd go to my dad and say, Dad, I just don't understand this. I just didn't expect this. What do I do with this? And my dad, with such wisdom and such kindness and patience, would, would always give me amazing counsel. You know, here's the thing. Ed Lovelace was never famous. He wasn't powerful by any kind of human standard of power. He never made a lot of money. In fact, for 40 plus years, dad was a high school English teacher in three different high schools. But I'll tell you what Ed Lovelace did have. He had influence. The word influence can be defined as the capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something. The capacity to have an effect. I found it fascinating. The word influence comes from a Latin, two Latin words, in and fluir, which is the idea of a flowing in. Picture a stream. Picture a river. A person's influence is like a current of water. The stronger the example, the more people are pulled along your life's path. And here's the thing. Some people have the influence of a raging river. They leave a dramatic impact on the people they come in touch with. They literally pull them along. They change our character. They change our lives. Some people barely have the influence of a trickling stream, but they still have influence. I heard that one time Billy Graham was in a particular city for one of his crusades and uh, traveling as he very often did. He really didn't know the area. And he came across a little boy on the street and he asked the little boy how he could find the nearest post office. 
And little boy gave him directions, told him you go up here and take a right, and then you take a left, and it'll be right there. And Billy Graham got down on one knee, and he said, Son, if you'll come to the convention center tonight, you can hear me telling everyone how to get to heaven. And little boy looked puzzled for just a minute, and he said, Mister, I don't think I'll be there. Billy Graham said, Well, why not? He said, You don't even know your way to the post office. So here's the thing, whatever your degree of influence, all of us have it. Sociologists tell us that even the most introverted to themselves type of person will influence some 10,000 people in the course of a lifetime. Think about that. The most introverted of us will pull 10,000 people along somewhere. Here's the question I want to pose this morning. You know if, if you come to Calvary too much. I, I loved at the car show that Keith Fletcher, the golden voice of Calvary, we call him, uh, this beautiful voice made for radio and TV, and he did all the announcing at the car show, and he, he invited everybody yesterday to church. And some of you may, may be here because of that invitation. And by the way, welcome. But, but Keith said, if you come tomorrow, we guarantee you three points from our pastor or we'll give you your money back. And Keith, I was scared to death I was going to have four today, but I'm, I'm, I worked it out. I worked it out. We love to ask questions here at our church, and, and just to take a moment on this Sunday before a lot of you go back to war on Monday, back to job, back to family, back to troubles, back to blessings, all of it. We love to pose these questions and just take a minute to do a little self-inspection. Where is the stream of your influence flowing where are you taking people fathers what a question on this father's day and by the way I, I promise I, I want today to be inspirational and motivational not a giant guilt trip because it, it is a truism in churches across America we will be so sweet to mothers on Mother's Day and beat the fools out of fathers on Father's Day and I don't intend to do that today. But daddies, it, on a day like this, isn't it, isn't it a great question to ask? Where am I taking my kids? How is my life pulling them along? How will they be shaped and impacted by the force of my existence? For each of us, how will my office, how will my school be impacted with the influence, the flow? of who I am and what I say and how I live. How will your neighborhood be impacted? How will this church be impacted? You know what? Harold Glover, his family would tell you, he wasn't perfect. There's not a person in this auditorium that is. But I tell you what, he loved Jesus Christ. And he influenced a whole generation of people. And there were a bunch of second grade boys that came through that class. And maybe there weren't people all over the church celebrating the teacher of the boys' second grade class. But I'll tell you what, some young men were influenced by what he did and what he said and who he was. Here's the thing. We said this last week. Wherever you're at today, Whatever the level of your influence, I mean, if you ask yourself that question and, and, and it's like the answer's not so good, Pastor, I hadn't done a great job and I'm afraid I've really lived for myself. I've had kind of a selfish existence and, and I'm scared that if that evaluation were done today, it wouldn't be so good. There was a guy I saw on Facebook, uh, somebody was showing me today, he had a shirt that he wore on Father's Day and it said, World's Okayest Dad. <laughs> That's humility there. Listen, wherever you're at, whatever your degree of influence, I'm here to tell you, while you're still drawing breath and that heart's beating and those neurons are firing, it's not too late to make a difference. There's really three ways you can influence others. You can influence others for evil. They say that Adolf Hitler, who wrote a book called Mein Kampf, My Struggle, for every single word in that book, 125 people lost their life in World War II. If you've ever seen that book, it is thick. For every word of it, 
125 people died. The stream of his life, the, the pull of his existence pulled people toward destruction. And listen, some of you don't have to look to some kind of history book to find an example of someone that influenced others for evil. The truth is some of you in your own family have a story not of beauty and grace and a good upbringing. You've got a story of pain. You've got a story of abuse. It might have been your earthly father. It might have been your mother. You listen, their impact on you, whether through desertion or neglect or abuse, hurt you. They pulled you down a tough path. And here's the thing. Some of you, you're still trying to get past your past. You can influence other people for evil. God help us not to be that kind of influence. Secondly, you can influence others for good. In 1981, Diana became the most talked about person on the globe when she married, married Prince Charles of England. How many of you remember that wedding? on television and all the stuff that went on with that. They say nearly one billion people, one billion, watched her wedding ceremony televised from St. Paul's Cathedral. But in 1996, a few years later, after a notoriously unhappy marriage, she was divorced from, divorced from Charles. She lost her title. She was no longer Princess Di. But when she died some years later in a tragic car accident, did you know that NBC estimated that not one billion people, but 2.5 billion people tuned in to watch her funeral? Why? Because in the years after she was a princess, she had given her life to AIDS research and to care for people with leprosy up close and personal and to help get stronger bands put on landmines she had taken up these causes and had helped people and her influence had grown listen you can influence others for good there are all sorts of causes out there of helping people and feeding people and clothing people and speaking encouraging kind motivational words you can influence others for evil, and you can influence others for good. But my friend, I want you to hear me this morning. You can influence others for God. And that one not only has an effect in this life beyond description, that one goes on into eternity. It shapes eternal souls. It helps change eternal destinations. It helps bring reward in this life and the one to come. I don't know about you, but I'm telling you, I long from the bottom of my heart, and I mess it up every day, I'm sure, in a thousand different ways. I long when Brian Lovelace's story is written, God help me to have influenced others for him, to have pulled somebody with me, on the stream that leads to eternal life in Jesus Christ. Here's the question. I, I would imagine many of you like me are like, Pastor, that's what I want to do. I want to make an impact. I want to draw people to God. I want to see people saved. I want to see people changed. I want to see people that are shackled by addiction and debt and problems, freed by the power of the gospel. I want to make an impact in this life. I don't want to just be that status quo individual just treading water till they die. If my life is going to touch the life of others, it's got to be about more than money and power and sex appeal. I want to pull them along toward God. But how do I do it? How can you be that kind of person? Because, hey, Pastor, I'm, you know, I'm no Billy Graham. I'm not perfect. I got a lot of issues, and I'm not that gifted in ways that I feel like I should be. I mean, how, how can little old me influence other people for God our text tells us how and it is really unlikely 
I don't think I've ever preached on this. I've referenced it. I don't believe I've ever brought a sermon out of this text. Exodus 34. How's that for a lengthy introduction? Sermon will be about the same length, so we're good. Exodus 34. How many of you with me this morning? Say amen. 34, verse 1. Here's a story. I'm going to make it quick. Moses has led the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. They've crossed the Red Sea. God has plagued the Egyptians and shown his powerful hand in mighty ways. And now Moses has gone up into Mount Sinai. He's received the Ten Commandments. And when he comes down from the mountain, the children of Israel have already abandoned God. They've already built a golden calf and said, let's worship this. And they are partying it up. And Moses is furious and he throws down the tablets pinned with the finger of God and shatters them. And the people are mortified and terrified and what's going to happen? And Moses goes to intercede for them before God. And God says, Moses, here's what I'll do. I'll send my angel. I'll still let you be a nation. I'll still wipe out your enemies. I'll send my angel in front of you to take you in, but I'm not going with you. And that for Moses, it punches him right in the heart. Because he understood something that I think we miss a lot of the time. Listen, paradise isn't paradise without God. It's just trees. It's just sunshine. It's just wind. Listen, a great lesson there. Money in and of itself. Power in and of itself. Acclaim and popularity and fame in and of itself can never be to you what you want it to be. Those things make terrible gods. They will break your heart. Moses says, God, if you're not going, we're not going. And he says, God, would you show me your glory? Would you let me see the majesty of who and what you are as a pledge that you're going with us? And God says yes, and he brings him back up in the mountain. And here's our text. Psalm 34, 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. I love that. Hey, remember those ones you busted? <laughs> I'm going to give you some more. And I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. And God hewed two tables of stone like the first, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and he took in his hand the two tables of stone. Now look at this. And the Lord descended in the cloud, and God stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now, this is fascinating for time's sake. Go down to verse 8. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. That's the posture of a man or woman that has seen the glory of God. Now go to verse 28. And Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. The picture is one so captivated and pleased in the glorious presence of God he doesn't even think about food or water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, Moses wist not. In other words, he didn't know that the skin of his face shone was shining while he talked with them. Go down to 34. 
excuse me, 35. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. Here's the picture. There's no need to overcomplicate it. Moses had spent time in the presence of a glorious God. 40 days and 40 nights so that when he came down that mountain and met with the people it was reflected on his face the glory of God that he'd been in the presence of was now all over Moses to the point that his face was shining how do we influence other people for God how do we pull them not toward destruction and not just toward a good happy life how do we bring people along the stream toward Jesus Christ and His Word and His power and His wonder and His glory. I have three thoughts for you. How do we influence others for God? We must know, we must show, and we must go. First of all, we must know. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said this, The reason why anyone refuses his assent to your opinion or his aid to your benevolent design is in you. He refuses to accept you as a bringer of truth because you think you have it, but he feels that you have it not. You've not given him the authentic sign. Let me break that down a little bit. You can't take anybody someplace you haven't been. You can't show others how good God is if you don't really believe it. You can't bring other people into His presence if you're not spending time in His presence. can't give others what you don't have so often listen I I think we preachers we talk about missions and we talk about evangelism we talk about all the things we ought to be doing and we give you statistics and we give you stories and we lay on the guilt real thick and the hope is that we'll feel so bad about the fact that some are going to hell and not everyone's going to heaven that we'll feel so bad about living a selfish existence that somehow that will bring us to repentance But friend, listen to me. The only thing that brings lasting repentance is to come into the presence of Almighty God and see that He's so incredibly good, it drives out lesser passions. The only thing that lasts is what the Bible says in Psalms, is to taste and see that the Lord is good. For 40 days, Moses is eating and drinking the glory of God, so much so he forgets about food, he forgets about occupation, he forgets about responsibilities, he forgets about hobbies. God is so good that his face is shining with it. Oh, listen, I think, at least for this father, when I think about my kids, and by the way, pray for our generation of parents we're the first generation of parents I guess across the board I'm not sure that the World War II many of you in that generation parents had had this fear we are terrified that we're messing our kids up terribly I never meet a parent now who doesn't have some degree of fear that I'm doing the wrong things with my kids and they're going to turn out in a way which I desperately don't want. In this age of media and pornography and distractions and violence and trouble and pastimes and mobility and we're driving all over the place and trying to make everything and, and cell phones and go to a restaurant and see whole families all on their cell phone two feet apart and they haven't said a word to each other. We're scared that we're messing it up. And listen, when I get that fear as a father, and yes, I get that fear as a father, I immediately want to do something, do something. Do, God, what can I do? What can I say? Where can I take them? What, can, what action is necessitated on my part to make sure my kids are influenced for you? And I think a lot of the time, God is like, 
I don't want to talk about what you do. I want to talk about what you are. Why don't you come spend some time in my presence and get so lit on fire by the glory of God that when your kids see you, your face is shining with it. What's the first way we influence others for God? We know God personally. We chase Him and seek Him till we see Him. Please don't make Christianity less than that. Y'all listen to me. This deal we come in and do on Sundays, this is not about learning facts. It's not about getting your theology all down perfectly where you can cross every T and dot every I and you got notebooks full of information. Listen, the Christian faith is about transformation. God says, I want it to go from here, that's where it starts, to here, to here, to here. I want you to experience the living God. I want you to know Him. I want to show myself so much higher than any earthly thing that you are changed by it. How do we influence others for God? We've got to know Him. We've got to spend some time in the mountain until we really see Him. Here's the second thing, and it's very simple. We show Him. <laughs> Moses isn't like putting glow paint on his face. He's not trying to work anything up. In fact, he's not even aware of it. He comes down the mountain and the people are the first ones that are like, what is going on here, Moses? <laughs> and Moses realizes, I didn't even know it. I didn't try to do it. I just spent time in the presence of God and it shows all over me. Hey, fathers, aren't you realizing something I'm realizing? Your kids are inevitably pulled along toward whatever you love. If you love baseball, chances are at least one of your kids loves baseball. If you love fishing or hunting or television or movies or video games or what, whatever that thing is that you're passionate about, I mean, when you talk about it, you get a glow. Almost invariably, one or more of your kids will follow that path to spend time with daddy while he does that. And here's what happens when you truly chase after God till you see Him. You don't have to do a thing. They can see it on your face. Well, my dad, he would go back. We had this little study on 3204 Auburn Street in Big Spring, Texas. We had a little bitty house. And, um, but his study, I mean, my dad would go back in there and he'd meet with God. He'd have his Bibles open and he'd be studying. And I'm telling, I, don't, I don't think he ever knew how profoundly impacting that was to my brother and I to see my dad back. He wasn't making a show of it. He wasn't making a big production. He just loved God and wanted to know more about him and wanted to know him more. And I'm telling you, he could have been William Shakespeare back there <laughs> writing his Bible lessons to my brother and I. He probably never knew that. But we were moved by his love for Jesus Christ. Adrian Rogers, that great old preacher, said this, Do you know what your children need to see in your home? They need to see a sincere love for God. They need to see in you a burning, passionate, emotional sincerity when it comes to the things of God. Kids can spot a phony a mile away, and they know whether or not you love God. And this part's hard, so I'm glad Adrian Rogers said it, not me. He said, it is the phoniness of parents, by and large, that turns kids off to the things of God. Oh, man. God help us not to be phony. God help this not to be some little Sunday dog and pony show we do. But God, I love you, and I know you, and my kids can see it, and my coworkers I don't have to bring in a family Bible, big neon shirt, Jesus saves. They know something's different and they start asking questions. Here's the last thing. How do you influence others for God? You know Him. You show Him. And lastly, you go. I, I've never seen this before. Like I say, I've never preached on this text. Verse 29. 
It came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai. He came down. You think it was a temptation for him to stay up? I just spent 40 days with God, man. I mean, it was so amazing. I didn't even need, like, food and water, and I got to go back down to them? Like, these messed up, messy, problematic, trouble-filled, sinful, addicted, broken people. I mean, I'm just, Moses is, like, crossing his fingers that they haven't built a second idol yet. God, I got to go down and deal with them? God, yes, yes, you do. But Moses, having experienced the glory of God, goes down into their lives, and he loves them, and he pours into them, and he helps them become all that they can be. Well, this is a great reminder for me as a pastor. Oh, I needed to hear this. A guy named Ari Kiev wrote these words. Everyone wants to feel that he counts for something and is important to someone. Invariably, people will give their love, respect, and attention to the person that fills that need. You win people's hearts by helping them grow personally. In other words, you cannot influence others at arm's length. You can't maintain all your privacy and your respectability. And Let's be honest, a lot of us keep everybody at arm's length because we have this very carefully crafted persona. We've worked for years to have people think that we're a certain way. And I don't want them getting too close to me and figuring out I'm not. But you really can't influence other people for God until you get into their lives, into the mud and the blood and the difficulty and the detail and you help them become all that they can be. You know what I'm learning about raising kids? God sent them them to me a certain way. (laughs) They already are bent a certain direction. They have certain aptitudes and certain passions and certain gifts. I didn't give them. God gave them. It's not for me to try to make them. It's for me to realize what God has made them and help them become all that they can be. But I'll be honest with you, I can't do that if I'm always working. I can't do that if I'm always occupied with some hobby that pulls me away from them. I can't do that if the most we have is a five-minute conversation and the rest of it's television and media. It takes time for me to know who they are and where they're going and pour into them what it means to be not only a a citizen and a man or woman, but a man or woman of God. Let me ask you a question. Again, ah, preacher, that makes me feel guilty. No guilt. Wherever you're at, that's where you're at. And all your journey up till now has shaped who you are and where you're going. And it won't be wasted. But who are we pouring into face to face close up helping them become all that God has intended for them to become listen in your office are you the one that when people have problems they come to you you're like no and I'm so thankful I'm not no wait a second are you the one listen I I've got some folks in this church I know when you're the individual you're the individual that when somebody's marriage is falling apart at work They gravitate your way. They've seen something in you that they feel, I can come to you and trust you with my heart, and I think think you're the guy to help me. I think you're the lady to help me. When they're struggling, when they're in pain, when their kids' lives become a train wreck, are you the one that they gravitate to? I tell you what, if you are, you've got an influence. You might not have known it, but your face has been glowing. There are people in your school, in your neighborhood, at your job, in your family, whether you knew it or not, they are being pulled along with the tide of who you are. I'm going to close with this. 
My life shall touch a dozen lives before this day is done. Leave countless marks of good or ill ere sets the evening sun. This the wish I always wish, the prayer I always pray. Lord, may my life help other lives that it touches by the way. Let's all stand. I heard it once said, and I think it's wisely said, that every, every sermon that makes an impact has to answer two questions. So what and now what? Why does influence matter? Because it's everything. And what do we do with this message? There are people in this auditorium, listen, you felt that prick of conviction from the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're too busy. And your life's so filled with 10,000 things that you can't do that one thing, which is follow Jesus and shine for him. What do you do? What do you do this week? What do you do tomorrow morning? Chase after him. Open up that book and say, God, I want to know you and I want to see you and I want to pursue you till I see you. I don't know how to do that. Friend, that's why we have a gospel class starting Wednesday. And this pastor will show you the things that God showed me years ago. Sometimes I practice and sometimes to my detriment I don't. But things that will change your life life will teach you how to seek his face somebody's here today and boy it moved me last week we had one young lady come and give her life to Jesus Christ some of you you've just never taken that step of faith you believe Christ is the Son of God you believe he's the Savior you know you're a sinner you know you you can't get to heaven on your own you know you can't be in a relationship with God like you are but you've never taken that step to simply say Christ here's my life hands off, control given up, Jesus save my soul and come into my heart, I'm yours. And I just want to ask you, why not today? Why not today? Why not come down and let one of our counselors show you how you can know Christ? Why not ask him right there in your seat and then come tell me after and let us celebrate with you? Whatever the need, listen, your one life, your one God-given life You are pulling people with you. Where are you pulling them? Where are you pulling them? Let's influence others for God. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the reminder that this sermon has been to me in my heart of the the preeminent things in life. We're so prone to lose those in all the hustle and bustle. But God, I pray for daddies all over this room, Lord, that you'll help us to be the kind of father we ought to be. God, we fail in 10,000 ways. But thank you that we're yours, and and Lord, you're working with us right where we are. Help us to influence our kids for God. And God, the same in our marriages, in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, in our schools. Help us to influence others toward you. And for that one who doesn't know Christ, oh God, that today would be the day you draw them. And they come to know you as the greatest father there is. It's in the beautiful name of Jesus we pray. Amen.